Welcome this evening to Three Artists, Three Women, an online conversation. I am so happy to welcome everybody here today. Again, my name is Sylvia Rohr. I'm the director of the UAG. And before I hand this over to Madeline Ghent and the artists of the AAP, I actually uh, want to give you a little bit of background about how we've gotten here and what we'll be talking about today. This conversation grew out of many previous conversations. In January 2020, which now seems an eternity ago, the UAG was putting up an exhibition called Mary Ethel Macaulay, Macaulay Behind the German Lines. Mary Ethel Macaulay was a Pittsburgh artist, a woman artist at the early, in the early years of the 20th century who spent much of World War I painting in Germany. She was notable not just because she was a woman artist at that time, but she was actually one of the first female artists and first members of the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh. This exhibition brought me together with Madeline. I, actually, Madeline brought the exhibition to the UAG through the owner of these works, Tasso Spanos, who I believe could not make it here today, but we wanted to give him a thanks. As we were preparing this show, Madeline and I, and I got together for a cup of coffee. And in this conversation of thinking about programming, we cooked up the idea of creating a companion exhibition, an exhibition that would highlight the works of three contemporary women artists who were members of AAP. It resulted in three artists, three women, and concentrates on the works of Tina Williams Brewer, Sheila Cuellar Schaefer, and Fran Jalamas. This exhibition was put together in record time, but the process itself was the epitome of collaboration. We spent much time with these three incredible women, and we see Fran on the left, Tina in the center, and Shayla on the right side, visiting studios. And what you see on the screen right now are two images of Emmy and Anna um, in Fran Jalamas' studio as we were selecting works for this exhibition. And this is an image of me and Tina actually in, enrobed in a, one of the works that would be in the show. Um, this, these visits culminated in this exhibition. And here you see the skirt, Gazelle, in, in collective gaze, uh, excuse me, Gazelle in the background, hung on the wall. The exhibition highlighted the works of Tina Brewer, and it included works from 2007 to 2017. We had a mini retrospective of Fran's work, beginning with this elegy to her mother from 1987 and classical appropriations on anchors on both sides of the gallery and some smaller, more recent works that she'll talk about later. And finally, we included a work of the three works that were made individually by um, Sheila Cuellar Schaefer that we hung as a triptych. In the gallery, we were actually envisioning not just highlighting or spotlighting individual artists, but thinking about their works as a conversation. This image, I think, brings to mind exactly what we hoped for. We wanted to see the styles, the works, the histories of these three women in conversation with each other, but also in conversation with Mary Ethel Macaulay. Our hopes were that by bringing these generations of women artists, these leaders of AAP together, that we would start to unwrap issues of identity, of the challenges of what it means to be a woman artist, the differing styles over time and approaches to artwork. This um, exhibition really was supposed to be a conversation on many levels, including the fact that we had planned an in-gallery conversation for March 2020. And I think I don't need to tell you it didn't happen. Um, unfortunately, like many other things in this past year, we put it off, we had to cancel it at the last minute, but I'm very happy to bring you this online conversation today. Our hopes for today are really to talk a little bit with each of these artists about works in this show, and then to open it up to questions from the audience as we start to think about some of the issues or questions they raise. Before we get to the conversation, I must give my thanks to a few people. First and foremost, these three artists. It has been incredible to work with them. It's been a gift to have the conversations we've had offline, online, in person, in studios. So my profound gratitude for them, for who they are, but of course for their work. For the entire staff of AAP, they all made this happen in record time and are making this happen today. So a special thanks to Dawn, to Jamie, to Sydney. 
and also to the UAG team and the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at Pitt, which always supports the UAG. And of course, special thanks to Emmy and Anna for being, part, being major people in this exhibition team. And Anna, a special note for you in terms of all of the graphic design that you created for this show and Emmy for taking the lead in curating this show. So with that, I would like to hand it over to one more person, Madeline Ghent, who I cannot thank enough for just being a person who, when you give her a cockamamie idea, she'll still say, let's do it. Let's see how to make it work. So after that coffee conversation, she made it work. So on that, Madeline, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I will forever be grateful to you, Sylvia, for just saying yes. Um, when, when I present you with um, some very, very interesting ideas. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Really quickly from Associated Artists of Pittsburgh, we want to thank our funders and our supporters, our board members, our artist members who now represent over 571 individuals who live and work in Pittsburgh, our many volunteers and specifically our staff, Don of whom is monitoring the chat today. Um, I want to thank the team at Pitt, Emmy, Anna, and Sylvia, and then these three artists. When Sylvia and I sat down for coffee and, and the, the conversation started as having a conversation um, with, with three women artists in Pittsburgh, um, I immediately thought of these three. I usually, this is the only time I've stepped in and, and jury to show, in part because the timeline was so short, um, uh, but also because uh, Associated Artists of Pittsburgh is really an organization that's built on the backs of women. I say I stand on the shoulders of giants every day. Uh, Shayla has a special connection to me. Per they all have a special connection to me personally, which you'll, you'll soon realize. She's a na native of Columbia, which my mother is also. She's primarily a painter whose work explores questions around identity, diversity, human rights, and social justice. Her work has been in the Carnegie, the Westmoreland, the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art, Susquehanna, and the State Museum of Pennsylvania. She's the lead artist of the, of the Billboard Art Project, and she's on the boards of the Westmoreland Diversity Coalition and currently serves on the board of the Associated Arts of Pittsburgh. Um, she's done double Zoom duty yesterday and today. She was sat in a board meeting last night. Um, and then I, I had to turn to Fran. Uh, Fran also, again, has a wonderful, special, personal collection, connection to me. She met my grandparents. She lived in my hometown for a bit in Franklin, Pennsylvania. She's a graduate of Chatham University, um, who's exhibited her work at the Carnegie, um, the Butler Museum of American Art Series Gallery in New York, as well as multiple associated artist shows. Um, she joined AAP in 1958. Um, uh, not that long ago, not that long ago, um, and served as our president twice and saw us through some, some difficult uh, transitions. Again, I say Associated Arts is built on the, and I stand on the shoulders of giants. Her work is in various public and private collections, and she's an arts teacher, writer, and advocate. Um, and you have to talk to Fran about her, her work um, trying to get health care for artists. This is a question that we're tackling with even still to this day. And last but not least, Tina, who welcomed me into this city with such open arms um, for, an, for a city that, you know, is, is not why we call it the most livable city. It's not really that for Black women in Pittsburgh, um, but she welcomed me with open arms. Um, also a Pittsburgh transplant. She's originally from Huntington, West Virginia, and graduated from the Columbus College of Art. Tina is a renowned fiber artist who uses symbolism, textile, and fabrics to explore themes of migration family, women, children, slavery, particularly the Middle Passage, jazz, and so much more. She's so, shown in so many art museums and so many collections, the Tampa Museum of Art, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, um, the Arts and Embassy Program, so she, she's had her work um, shown in the continent of Africa and Ghana, the State Museum of Pennsylvania, the Westmoreland recently acquired one of her pieces, the African American Museum in Dallas, um, but I think some of my favorite Tina stories that I've heard revolved the jazz club um, that her and her husband established um, in what was the former trolley barn, um, which maybe we can get into some details. So that just sounds like it was a lot of fun and I'm, I've, I wish I would have been there from the start. Um, Tina's also served on our board. I mentioned Fran was board president. Shayla's currently on the board and Tina is currently an emeritus board member. So again, um, Associated Artists is, a, is an organization led by women um, and I'm so grateful and so grateful for everyone's time tonight to join us and celebrate their work. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it back over um, to Sylvia and to the artists to talk about um, this exhibition that you all see. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Madeline. We would like to spend a couple of minutes talking to um, each of the artists and having them present one of their works that is included in the show and really perhaps some of the reasons we chose them. And I'd like to actually begin with Tina. This is um, Tina's work here, He Shall Dance and, and uh, Gazelle that you see on the wall that was done in collaboration with Sandra German. Um, but Tina, I think you, I believe you wanted to speak about this work in a little bit more detail this evening. So first of all, welcome. And, Thank you. and this was one of the uh, six works of yours, I believe that were in the show. And um, this is one that we, we actually saw in your studio, in your home, and we all fell in love with it. So if you could tell us a little bit about this work. Okay, well, basically um, this piece is important because it's all about women and I thought that was the platform from which we were gonna speak. And uh, I made it in 2007. And uh, it's important because it has some of my dear friend, Jan Myers Newberry's uh, Shibori work on the back background in each medallion overlaid by square from a quilt block, quilt that I cut up that belonged to my great, great grandmother, Idy Cunningham's from Kentucky. And then it's uh, superimposed with imagery of women that um, are dear to my heart, women that are part of our community. And um, so I'll talk about a couple of the medallions. Each one has its own story. And, um, each one uh, represents more it compound the stories. So the one in the top right hand, left hand corner is a woman from my church. Let's see, can we kind of like zero in that a little bit more? I don't think we can, I'm sorry. That's okay, that's all right. So she's, um, she's a woman from my church and basically I just thought that she had kind of that mystery, mystery about her look a, a look of uh, sophistication yet wise. And um, so I asked her if I could take, take her picture and she of course agreed. I also worked for the Department of Aging some for some six or seven years and I took pictures of senior citizens. So uh, because I grew up with my uh, extended family in Kentucky, I, I have an affinity for older people and listening to their stories and I think that it's important to rise up for them, their stories uh, that are really important. Next to uh, this lady from my church, which I don't have her name, and I'm sorry I didn't take the names down, is uh, Couture, who had a facility in Wilkinsburg some years ago uh, called, um, oh my goodness, well, I can't, it's not going to come now. It's just not going to come. It just disappeared. Uh, but Couture, she was somebody that I used fabric from her every time I started to quilt. She was really important to me. And it's like she blessed all of the work that I did for the entire time. She and Jomo had this wonderful business that we visited. And she added to my knowledge base and my cultural interaction because I was wasn't really that well versed in Africanisms, but the books that I got, my husband and I started to collect from, from, uh, oh, goodness, why does that go away? Uh, somebody should to put it in the chat because it's, a, it's one of those senior moments. Um, but we collected books every year for a holiday only from her, from her uh, business because we felt like we wanted to promote African-American businesses. Besides her is a picture of Mary Martin's mother who is Sarah Jamila. So she is a sage of the community as well and another lady named uh, Sylvia. So just capturing all of these different women and layering them into one medallion was, I thought it was a great idea, but then I moved on to capturing some of the things that were important to, you know, what helps support women women. So the, the, it's the church. So my grandmother's had a famous saying, which is first God, first, then family, and then community. So that's what you see in, in the other layers of the medallions. Um, on the far right is Katie Effort and um, Kay Leroy Ervis, Kay Leroy Ervis, his wife. And she is a beautiful, beautiful woman. And um, I asked her if I could take her picture and she said, yes. So what you then begin to see in each medallion is also a circular bubble. And the bubbles are 
representational of a different vision. So the work is called um, Veiled Perspectives and if Perspective. And that is because we think that we know who people are and we assume by just the outward look that we can read what they are. And oftentimes African-American women have to shelter their emotions and stand straight and tall and, and kind of what they say, just suck it up. And so in this, I, I have this uh, picture that is a, of a one window in, um, what is in, I think it's in, in Highland Park and it's on the third floor. And I took three different versions of the same, same item. So it just talks about what you see, it depends on your perspective. And so as you turn and you look, everybody sees something different. And so I, I, so I, I guess it's a rise up for um, giving everybody the opportunity to, to be able to say that they have a different vision than the one that you see and being able to embrace that. And, um, and I use that with my, my students all the time because different visions brings creative ability. And you know, I'm always about that. And then my, in the center is my great grandmother, my great grandmother from Kentucky and Cuesta Bensbury, who is um, a historian for all the, for the, our quilters. And she wrote so many books, so I wanted to honor her. And um, last, I'm, I guess I should kind of go way down a little bit, which is on the far in left corner is my picture of my mother. And I really uh, wanted to speak on behalf of her today because as we all are, we are our mothers. And she fought very hard for children and children with disabilities. And she worked in the Head Start program in Tina, I, I, I have to comment that when I'm looking at this work and hearing you talk about it, I can't help but think about like this, you talked about this idea of listening to stories and then, and then putting them in, in, into your work. And the role of women as both the keepers of knowledge, the leaders of the community, the protectors of children that you're showcasing in, your, in this piece. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit to that to that idea of telling other stories, in this case specifically of women's stories, and how important that is um, for a piece like this and for your work. Well, um, I think in the in the the center piece at the bottom too is 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 a prominent family in in Homewood, which is the Baker family, and there you have generational power. And um, I've worked. Uh, for probably four years with Regina and during um, cultural responsive art education and uh, her family she her that has four generations uh, there with her mother and her grandmother and they are just so strong and and worked so hard for the community that I, I just felt like that was the uplift that I wanted to bring um, as a business owner I guess you know um, I found out a lot more than I really wanted to, uh, that the, there's a lack of respect for the word as it is gentle. Uh, and thus came another piece that I had to do, uh, which was, uh, if you don't hear the tap, you hear the bang. So most of my work, what came out of experiences in the community. And uh, oftentimes people didn't even know that I was, you know, the proprietor because I was doing the schlep work and cooking and cleaning and that kind of thing. But, um, but there was, there was a, a, just a bit of um, uh, neglect, I guess, for and respect for a woman's voice if it is not loud and boisterous. And, and I wasn't brought up like that. So, you know, so I make, so I made a quilt. If you don't hear the tap, you hear the bang. And that bang was when my husband gets here, you're gonna listen. So, so, so my husband was, the, he was the bad guy and I was a soft-spoken person. And um, it, it kind of carried on, you know, pretty back and forth. But um, basically this piece represents many different voices, many different tones, many different contributions um, on so many levels. And um, to just speak to the overall is don't underestimate, 
don't underestimate the power of a person just because they're not loud and they're not boisterous. There's a lot of power in still waters run deep. Let's leave it there. Oh, that, I love that, Tina. And I, I wanted to point out too, like, I wanted to add that your layering of experience are these named figures, but also many unnamed women. You bought some of these items in, a, in the background fabric in a, I believe in a yard sale, was that right? In well, the, um, the, the, not the, it wasn't the, the background fabric, which is the medallion circles uh, is, is Jan Meyer's Newberry. She gives me her scraps. I'm a, first of all, I'm a scrap quilter. Oh, I mean, actually on the background of the quilt. The background of the quilt. Okay. So they are, um, one skirt is from Kim Berkeley Clark's mother and she's the judge. And another one is from Valerie Westcott, and that is from her mother-in-law. And um, what, I'm trying to think what the other one, there was one other lady who gave me a Patricia Prattis. When she, when she um, took care of her mother's things, she donated some of her things to me. And so one of the skirts came from Patricia oh. Prattis's mother so i mean the work the that's why i said the work itself is is the imagery but it's also the energy of the cloth that also informs the work and so when people see the work sometimes they don't understand why the emotional attachment is there but when you connect with the cloth physically with your hands that energy then becomes part of what people take in when they are part, when they're interacting with the quilts. And the quilts are all supposed to be viewed more than one time. And you keep coming back and keep noticing. And um, you'll see that some of the embellishments that are there are basically there because, um, you know, um, pearls of wisdom, you know. So, I, you know, these are the ladies that we get the pearls of wisdom from. So you just added the pearls in there. Then um, I have a, um, a, re a reflection of the, um, from, from Egypt. So, and the Nile River, which is kind of like the cradle of civilization. So, you know, I've done several pieces around, you know, water and creation. And I always try to have a, some reference to water in the work uh, because it is our beginning. I love that. Thank you, Tina. And I actually brought a detail. I feel sad that we can't actually be in the gallery together. This is not from this piece, it's another piece, but I wanted to be able to give people a sense of your layering This is um, and, and your work. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that perhaps in the Q&A. Okay. Right now, I would like to kind of take this idea of stories, history, women's stories, and move our conversation to Fran. And Fran, um, Fran's works, as I mentioned at the beginning, were a bit of a retrospective in this show where we were spanning a huge range of time from works that were from the early 1990s. This is classical appropriations. Um, and this is a detail of that work that she was working in to an earlier work, which was more abstract, an elegy to her mother. And Fran, I believe, and this is a detail of that work, that um, today you wanted to talk a little bit more about this series of new works, these small scale format mixed media images that um, kind of tell the stories of people in the Rust Belt, but particularly women in the Rust Belt. And Fran, you wanted to focus mostly on this work, I believe. I yes, um, I, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, and there were two major influences from Youngstown. One was that it was a heavy steel industry. I grew up thinking that the sky was orange because it was most of the time um, that I was there. And I also grew up, luckily, in the Butler Institute of American Art, which frequently had student exhibitions all the time. So I was exhibiting from the time I was 10 and I took it for granted looking at the John Singer Sargents uh, and Crack the Whip and so many other classic American artworks. It was wonderful for me. Um, this painting or this photo assemblage, as I call them, is about time and place. My father was born on a tiny island in Greece called Kithira. It's on the southern tip of the Peloponnese. It's very small, population 3,000. But um, 
Sylvia, you'll enjoy this. Watteau thought it was important enough to do a painting about it, and it was called The Embarkation to Kithira. It was done in 1717, and it can be seen in the Louvre in Paris, and I have seen it. Um, it was known as the island of poets, writers, painters, and another fact is that Aphrodite was supposedly born there. The, I'm using icons of the Black Madonna and icons of the Black workers in U.S. Steel. The Black Madonna is called Mertidiotisa. She is venerated all the time, but on September the 25th, people come from all over Greece and all over the world to venerate her, and she's a healing saint as well. The foreground figures are female steel workers, and I just delighted in, in juxtaposing the time, the place, the, um, uh, the um, work that they all did. That's the fun of being an artist. We can, as my, we can do whatever we want, and it was great fun mixing those periods, those times, those places. Um, a lot of my more current work is deals with um, women steel workers and women and the identity of women. I had a show in Homestead in 2003. It was a huge show and it was called She Worked in a Mill. The same show was in the series gallery in New York City, which I should talk about a bit. I became a member there in 1993. There are only two galleries in New York City dedicated entirely to women. Series gallery was find, founded in 1983 and it's still going strong. I was elected as a member and I have had seven solo exhibitions there. One of the reasons that for the downsizing is just the logistic. The other two huge paintings in this show had to be taken to UAG with trucks and it required a couple people handling them. Those two large paintings, which I love, my natural inclination is to work very, very large. But again, for practical reasons, I've scaled back and I'm I'm trying to enjoy it, but it's harder. My background is reflected quite a bit in this with the Byzantine gold uh, and the uh, and the, the steel industry, two major factors. Um, I had planned earlier to thank <laughs> to thank uh, Sylvia who's a dynamic and brilliant woman. And I first met her when she talked about the WPA, WPA for artists that Roosevelt set up. And that was at the Frick in another location. She is an authority on the murals. She's an, a very exciting and a uh, very wonderful person. And I wanna thank Madeline Gent, who is now this, the executive administrator of the executive director of an organization that we know is 110 years old. I think she's brought youth and vigor, intelligence, dynamite to the organization. So I thank her as well. And Anna and Emmy who installed the show, the building is a difficult building. It has soaring ceilings and um, rotundas. And I'm just sorry that it isn't open for people to see the work in its actuality because it really is something. They've, uh, they've done a wonderful job. Any questions about all of this? Fran, I wanna ask you one question real quick. How did yeah. you feel about the juxtaposition of kind of, you said a mini retrospective that you have kind of three very style, various styles of I feel like Sylvia may have pulled the Emmy when my, and then Anna may have wanted some of those pieces in there, but um, what did that mean to you to have um, such a wide body of work shown? 
Well, I've been, I've been doing it for over 50 years. And I've been exhibiting since I was 10. So you don't want to come to my studio because it's loaded with artwork. My house is too. And I, knowing myself as I do, there are similarities between the very huge paintings and even the small ones because there's, there's a sense of designing all the space. I was trained by Charles Leclerc, who's a very demanding artist, a very fine artist, later became the, uh, um, anyway, he was at Chatham and was my mentor. And I was trained really classically. We did all the still lifes and, you know, it was, it was hard work. Um, they trans, they transition, the large pieces actually transition to the smaller, but I miss the air and the breathing space in the smaller pieces. And, and I, chose, I chose a square format because there's an illusion of more space with a square than, than any other shape. So they're all, they're all squares when I work smaller. And, and we can talk about this a little further, but I wanted to just add that I think the experience in Fran's studio was so exciting for us. And I think for you too, Fran, in terms of there were works that Fran hadn't looked at in years and that we were pulling out and having the discussion of how one era moved into another and, and the continuities between those. So we were really hoping to get that kind of, um, the continuities between larger pieces and the smaller pieces, but also to see that change. And some of the, the repeated themes you had had, Fran, too, in terms of your roots but also your family, which we saw in Tina's works too. And it's something that came up in Shayla's works as we were actually thinking about a newer gener another generation of artists who are coming to Pittsburgh. We realize none of us is from Pittsburgh, so we're all actually um, looking at this city anew. I would love to come back to some of these questions, Fran. I just wanted to move on to Shayla just to give her a moment to talk about her work and then we'll continue that conversation. Um, Shayla's three works that came to us we're all from 2020. And actually, I believe from early 2020. So um, they were very new and these were the first place they were shown. And Sheila is originally from Palmira, Colombia, but I think she's been in the US since 1999. I might be wrong about that year, but I think that's what I have in my mind. And Sheila, um, we talked a little bit about how these work individual works, but then how we put them together as sort of a triptych. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you, think about these works and your process. Uh, sure, Sylvia, thank you. And uh, Tina and Fran, your work is so profound and inspiring for me. It's just thank an you. honor to have my work with yours. Um, well, my work, as um, Madeline was saying, I work um, around the themes of uh, diversity, um, inclusion, human rights, and uh, of course, migration. I am an immigrant and that's just a subject that comes to me. So when um, I found out about the opportunity of uh, exhibiting here, I thought that um, it, it was a good moment for me just to touch just in uh, immigration since my work was like, had a lot of political commentary, but it was mostly based on um, what I see is, um, as I call it, like, like sugar-coated ideas presented to people when there's like an order laying of reality. Um, this, um, uh, this subject, I guess, is I'm thinking is because uh, being an immigrant and being a, a woman that grew up with like very strong female figures um, in my family. I just gravitate about like to painting about women and growing, and growing up also as a Catholic person, like going to a Catholic school had um, all this idea of this iconic images from like going to church like stuck to me so it was just something natural to me to move into uh, this type of work. Um, the idea here was um, 
it's about talking about immigration, but also to highlight what's happening with the women and the families that are the separated in the border. And uh, I think it's important to kind of feel like a liberation for them about the stereotypes and lift them up for what they are. So um, thinking about, I, I was thinking a lot about um, what it's the definition of a Catholic, what it is to be a saint. And, and it's just, it's like ordinary people who have done extraordinary things in their lives and that's how they become saints. And to me, um, these women that they risk their lives to cross the border, to just give, to have the idea of, you know, give a better lives to their kids and their families, that is something extraordinary. And I wanted to represent that with this um, ornate outfits for them, um, I don't. Um, I wanted to talk also about the um, the Angeles Arcabuceros. The Angeles Arcabuceros are like a, a representation of angels that have like kind of like a rifle holding, and it was something in the La Escuela de Cusco and uh, during, the, during the Virreinato that they, um, this, uh, when the people from Europe came here, um, came to Latin America, they used these images to kind of create like a cult and uh, they used religion to convince the natives to um, where they were offering. So they became Catholic and then that's how they started um, uh, painting these angels and they became like something so important that they, they became actually popular at that time. So I found like that contradiction interesting in using those um, ornate outfits and um, to highlight this women. And um, I want to, I have um, a little, I, an example here. Let me see if I can show this to you. This is something I own that, um, it's one of those angels. It's not the angel Arcabucero, but it's the other example of that school. They have the one that has the wheat in their hands. And this is, I, I believe it's, it, this should be a print that has been like highlighted, like with highlighted details. Can people see it? Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that idea of using um, those pieces of clothing like that to kind of like, give some liberation to these women was um, the whole idea behind these paintings. And uh, like, if, but if you see like they are, they can look also modern because I try like the, like if you see the one on the left, the, the women like with the cape, she's also wearing like a jumpsuit. So it's kind of like, it's the entire idea of the women being liberated from this. And um, let me see. Jayla, can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. of um, can you talk about the color red in this work, in these works? I mean, they're, they're hung as a, as a triptych so wonderfully well, um, but here the red is just, it feels so deep. And when you see it in person, it does come across um, as, as kind of a subject within and of itself. But can you speak to, speak to why red um, or, um, <laughs> you know, it seems a little like, yeah, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more okay. about that. Yes, and I, th this is, uh, this, you've seen so much red and this type of red in my painting is also something new. I wanted to use that color um, because it was used in those paintings and also because more importantly is 
that I feel that like this situation with these women is just uh, so profound in what is like taking a child from their mother is something that you feel like you, they, they are taking something from inside you. So I wanted to use that color to represent the depth of that, of the pain. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I have a kind of a question I want to post to all three of you because it kind of goes to, to this, my starting point. Um, in, your, in your roles as artists, but also as, as very active members of an, of an arts community that is Pittsburgh. And you're all three very interestingly transplants. I think Don from our staff is like the only true Yinzer. Um, even though Don's not a Yinzer, sorry Don. Um, but I'm wondering if all three of you play, have played such strong leadership roles and also showcase women as leaders in your work. Um, do you see that as, as, a, as an important part of your artistic practice or do you kind of see them as separate items? Um, I guess, how do you integrate one with the other? Madeline, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I'm going to stop the screen share so we can move to Q&A, but I can pull it up for anybody who might need to look at an image. Sorry, I interrupted your question, Madeline. You're going to have to ask it again. <laughs> yeah, so just, just to hear more from, from you all as, uh, as, as women. Uh, I, you know, I'll pick on Fran because I always pick on Fran. Um, one thing that came up is that you don't necessarily see yourself, you kind of see, you know, your role as an artist separate in many ways as, instead of like a, a woman artist. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit more. Um, well, well, I, I have gone through life with the name Francis, which can be male or female. And uh, uh, there have been many times in my life where they've called to speak to Francis. And when I get on the phone, I'm very disappointed that I'm a female. I've had that experience many times. And, or the work is, is, is interpreted as being the work of a man. And frequently in art school in those days, in the dark ages, uh, sometimes the teachers would talk about the work being very masculine, and that was a compliment. But I'm straying. Um, I've always thought of myself as an artist, not necessarily a female artist, till, till the movement really happened, kind of with the guerrilla girls pointing out um, the lack of presence in history books about women. Women were doing art, but they weren't acknowledged. Uh, the lack of representation in museums done by women. All those facts, I was ignorant. I became educated to them, and they became important to me, and that's why I enjoy being a member of the series gallery, because they are a ferocious group of dedicated women who want representation, who demand excellence, and are very activist. It's inspiring to me. Don't misunderstand. Um, I have favorite artists and they're male and female and I don't care who did it. In fact, that's why I like about being an artist is that I am not visible. My work is my statement. I don't have to dance or recite poetry or act. My work represents me. And it doesn't matter who I am, really, male, female, or whatever. It's the work that stands out. And that's what I think is so important about blind juring. Very important. I really don't like uh, segregated exhibitions, though I understand the necessity for them at these times. I was asked to be in a show several years ago that represented Greek artists. I said, no. I'm going to pass on that. I don't want to be thought of that. I'm an artist. Um, I think I would pass on exhibits that would say, just, we just want women. We just want people with brown hair. No, no. I don't want that kind of categorization. Um, I've, so does that answer your question, Madeline? <laughs> yes, I also did select you. <laughs> You're a woman artist who's a leader, so <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> 
comes to mind, Fran, too, as we were talking, we brought up the, in our preparation for this, the first time you met Tina was actually in another, um, one of your identities, actually, right? In terms of your writing. And I wonder if you could recount a little bit that story of how you and Tina met and in what role you were at that point. Well, there was a publication in Pittsburgh called The Women's Voice. And I, I would read it regularly. I don't know if anybody remembers it because it's long gone. But there was nothing in the publication about women in art. And I called, I called the publisher, her, name, her last name was Buma. I don't remember the first name. And I said, are you interested in having anything on art in your newspaper? Because I'd be willing to do it. And I'd call it Women in Art but I don't wanna be identified as Fran Jalamas. So I'm gonna make up a, a false name. I'm gonna go by Franny Bernard. And so she said, sure. And another thing I can't type, so I'm gonna to have to send it <laughs> in longhand. They said, sure. And I started, Tina was one of the first people I started with because she um, had, her work was accepted in, um, um, a Pennsylvania State exhibition and I was very interested in her quilts and in the stories of her quilts. So uh, she was one of my first people that I interviewed and I went to visit her at her her place in uh, Homewood and um, fell in love with with Tina and her background and the fact that she had come to Pittsburgh from Columbus and really didn't have knowledge. No, not from Columbus, no, Parkersburg. But yeah, she moved from Parkersburg and, and her experience there in West Virginia was that she did not experience uh, a lot of um, uh, discrimination as a black person. She, it was foreign to her, but when she came to Pittsburgh and she married, she had to educate herself to that discrimination to that racism and she her husband helped her and she took classes and she learned and then she incorporated incorporated in her work and recently she talked about Pittsburgh having underground tunnels uh, for people to reach freedom and it's, she's a fascinating lady and her work is profound and enriching and enduring uh, I also interviewed Vicki Clark. She was wonderful. I called her my, what did I call her? Uh, <clears throat> Vicki, who is it's closely tied to Pitt and wonderfully tied to Pitt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I called her an art evangelist, oh. an art evangelist. That's what she is. She's an art evangelist. I took several courses from her at the museum and she talked about contemporary art. She's up to the minute on everything and she's she is really absolutely brilliant. I interviewed Irene Pasinski, who is one of the country's first industrial designers, female industrial designers. Uh, her we're, hoping, we're, her hoping to get, Fran, we're hoping to get this archive out there so that we can all read all the, the lists of the interviews for sure, because it seems like, it seems like a treasure trove. And I remember um, well, Tina, Tina, you were saying too that in the process of this meeting, you you met Shayla for the first time. Like the three of you, some of you knew each other before, but but actually in this process, Shayla was kind of new to this this scene, and you were very taken with her work. What was it about that it worked, appealed to you so much about her work? You know what, her work it was emotional, and I think that's what I was drawn to. And basically, I think we were neighbors for uh, a show down in um, the cultural district, uh, seven oh nine, and yeah. wasn't that Shayla? Was that the show? Yes, we next door um, I remember I went to see the gallery when you your show was up, and that's how uh, that's how we met. Yes, it was, and it was right next to yours. Right. But we kept running into each other and she kept reminding me what her name was. And I, I'm really horrible with names. And but I always remembered her. I, and, so. but I know work, you. I know I, you. <laughs> I, know, I, I know you because I, I loved your work and I loved the, the your realism and your technique. And so um, 
you know, there was, there was a wonderful connection. And when she came over, we visited. So we, we are very connected now. And I thought that it was important because of um, what Fran had done for me, which was, you know, kind of dragged me out of obscurity. I was working and I was showing, but I wasn't really um, organized. <laughs> and I and I thought that that organization that that time that she took to really show me the ropes and and she shook her finger at me and told me what I needed to do to go forward and I tried it my best but I didn't stay organized, but um but I also felt that if so there were so many people who reached out for and was one of the first and then um, Jean Grinholz was one of the others from the five arts skill. So there were these pivotal women that were substantial in trying to push me along in a place. But my biggest, I think, thank you goes to the, um, to the community who really opened my eyes up to the impact of the African diaspora of, of the ancient history versus just thinking about slavery. So most of my work, you know, I am an African, I am an African American working for African Americans and for the diaspora. I have like, that has been my passion. I've stayed on that topic pretty much all the way through. And I think before I found that I didn't, um, I didn't know what it was to make meaningful art because I was a commercial artist. So, you know, so giving the layer of culture and how important it is to bring you into your identity. Um, and and I, so as I found out about certain things that I thought were important, I made a quilt about them. So that's why I have 85 quilts, you know, or, and about, because they were all stories that I felt were important to tell. And uh, Shayla, you're, I mean, for me, you're just starting out. You're a rising star. I'm so excited to see all the work that you're doing and, you know, your, um, your work on the AAP uh, website this month is something to be seen. So congratulations. And, and I'm going to say thank you to Madeline and Sylvia and the whole team for putting this together because it's been really wonderful. It's um, my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. I, I, I would I, like to add, can I add something? We're going to have, I, I would like to add that we're going to have a conversation next month with um, Tina about the Build for Art project. And uh, so, yes. And now, uh, um, I'm just so happy to work with her. And I think uh, Susan Slavic is also here. She, two artists that I admire very much. Shayla. Yes. Thank you for saying that because I think that's a really important point too. The work is still going on and there's a lot of things and this conversation is clearly just beginning. I feel like if um, I know some people may have some questions, even though we're running down on time. So please drop that in chat if you have right now. But I do want to take a moment to thank these three artists and we hope and the entire everybody for being here. I would like to also bring up one other element that we, that actually Tina reminded me of and as she was speaking of her mother. And um, you may have noticed in some of the photos, the artists were beyond, behind, beneath a, a sign that said, Di su nombre, say her name. And we actually um, decorated the entire Rotunda Gallery with that phrase, say her name in four languages to pay homage to Fran in Greek, Sheila in Spanish, Tina in English, and Mary Macaulay in German. Um, we thought of that in January, and, the, and, the, and we really thought about it as all the women artists who have been forgotten in history, um, and the people whose women's names who we've forgotten, and we actually all said a name at the opening. I would like us to take a moment in chat, if you wanna share a name, of someone, a woman or somebody. And of course, since then, you may we think of Brianna Taylor as we think of that and we, we raise her up in this moment. But um, this was part of an endeavor of the UAG and the AAP to really think about saying their names, saying the names of women artists who are working, who have worked in the past, women artists whose names may not have been in history and women's artists who are still are surrounding us and around us today. So I wanna thank everybody. And if you have a moment, put that in your chat and then turn on your camera so that we can give, a, and your mics, so that we can give a round of applause to everybody who's been here today. So if you wanna take your cameras off and take your mics off 
And then on the count, uh, we'll wait till everybody's here. Madeline's just ready to clap. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I love that. My other grandma Inez, I love that. So on the count of three, a round of applause for all the women here and otherwise who have been part of this conversation. Hooray. Woo so yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Madeline, any party? Girl. Girl. Any, any parting words on my end? No. Um, except keep up the good work. Um, I, I'm such a, a fan of all three of you, as well as there's so many women artists in, who came, and I just see their faces now, um, that like, you all just, I just stand in awe of all of you. I agree. It was wonderful. It was one. Thank you. We, we, stand in all, we stand in awe of you. We do. Yeah, it was, it together. Was, it was really wonderful. Mm. Oh, thank you. We will continue this conversation in some form online. As the exhibition is actually still hanging in the gallery. So hopefully one day we can actually open that up again. We will be making a digital version of Mary Ethel McCauley. So that will be our next conversation. And we hope to bring these wonderful women back for that as well. So thank you, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well and happy. So good evening. Thank you. 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 Thank I think it's people are, are it, it's the equivalent of people streaming out of a lecture hall. I always find this uh, the funny, the, the everything now has a virtual component, so it's fun. Amy, how, from Germany, it's bedtime for you, I bet. <laughs> it is, now it is Wednesday morning in Germany, so I'm gonna go off to bed. Okay. Oh, good to see you, Amy. It was so good to see you, Emmy. It's so lovely to see you. So I hope we can catch up again and continue the conversation. It was too short, but it was it was the start. Sure. I hope we can all meet up again too. Oh, the yes. dream. That art is that I show know. is frozen in time. Frozen in time. Absolutely. Frozen in time. But it still looks. Are you say in Spanish? Cuando éramos felices y no lo sabíamos, right? When we were happy and we didn't know it. Oh, yes. yes. You know, I have to admit, like when I was showing right. those things before, the images of the before, what a different world. And it was a matter of yes. two weeks, right? Two it weeks. Was, it, it just hit New York We were because we were talking with somebody that came in to visit that day and she was leaving to go back to New York. So it really had not blown up as it did. But, uh, you know, it, it is a different world and... Boy, we just got in under the wire. We really we, did. We had a great turnout that night, though, too. And it was wonderful. It was a great turnout. It was so it beautiful. Was so festive. I have to remember, I, I felt like it was one of the best feelings on yeah. that night. It, it was about the feeling. That's it, what I'm was just, it was just joyful. But the installation was brilliant, and that has to be uh, recorded yes. for posterity, especially well, saying her name. That was so deeply touching. Yeah, when you said that in all four languages, that was just such a good moment, right? It was oh, yeah. brilliant. It was brilliant. People. It was absolutely yes. brilliant. I was it so was. We had to we had to say thank you to Tassos because his incessant <laughs> calls to me were like, you need grad students. And, oh, yeah. and Sylvia took Tassos on and approached me about finding three awesome artists to talk about the work and Tassos, however he is doing, kudos to him. <laughs> how, how, long were, how long will the, the show still, will they keep it indefinitely? I mean, I, I don't have any need for the work. It's hanging someplace. I hope it's still, well, so the problem had been this semester that pit opened, then closed, and now we're in lockdown. If it hadn't been for Anna, who had the installation shots, I would not have been able to get in today for the inst installation shots. So that was actually really lucky. I actually think Pitt will open again in some <laughs> limited way, the gallery, uh, in mid-January. And my hope is then that we can kind of do a refresh 
And Emmy, Anna, and I are working on an online exhibition for Mary Macaulay. So I think that's our time to think about what, what can we do as a companion or how can we how can we refresh this in another way too? Because it does look beautiful. And my biggest heartbreak was it was so short. Uh -huh. Essentially two weeks before the exhibition yeah. closed. That was it. Uh -huh. I mean that I mean it closed, I mean before the, the world public. Before yeah. COVID. Right. Before yeah. the world closed down. We didn't close yeah. it. So like um but that was <laughs> that was definitely it, it it definitely felt like it didn't get the show it needed. Right. But I'm so happy that we have this conversation today. I was really I'm so glad, Madeline, that you know, again. Thank you, Madeline. Yay! Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> Big Surely. cheers to those two. For, and Anna redid the poster and we ended up getting it all done. So um, we work well as a team. I just think we should open our own little- I do too. Well, you I'm have. Been, you I'm have a fan club already. <laughs> it's I've a been mutual. In many, many, I've been in many exhibitions as the rest of you have, but maybe this is my favorite oh. because it was painless. This has been my favorite fun. too. It was painless. It was fun working with you all, and it was highly professional at the same time. We it didn't. was just a dream. It oh was a dream God. experience. Yeah. You're so you're yeah. so kind. It's a mutual love society. No, I'm not kind. It's it's just factual. I'm not kind. <laughs> you made it. You made it easy. We had so much fun in the pro. I mean, it was. I mean, Emmy and Anna can talk to this, but how much did we love going? To the studios and like thinking this through and emmy the best image i have is emmy working on the weekend with the layout <laughs> like a big, like of like you there like i have my images of people in the gallery but of you seated in the gallery kind of really thinking of layout and like kind of mapping it up emmy that's still in my office like still hanging there as like <laughs> you guys <laughs> be so hanging in your brain too obviously yeah, yeah that's a good thing it's just nice to think about dialogue even when you're curating the dialogue between the two pieces the th pieces and the people and it's lovely but it's also, you know, i don't know if you know this but shayla like had one piece sort of complete of the three <laughs> yes i heard that sylvia <laughs> and i was like i was like shayla's got this in the back of my head i was like i don't know how she's gonna do this <laughs> you did it shayla you knocked it out i love those three pieces <laughs> They're she so beautiful. There are. Well, Shayla reminds me of when I was young and I could do that, just knock them out and put a put a fan on them to dry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, now you reminded me of one time I did that and the, <laughs> the paint was way too liquid and the result was, well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Oh, oh my lord i didn't even notice you know, the work the work was disparate but it worked all together it was i thought it very was. disparate it was very yeah disparate, but then it ended up as we were talking there even as you're talking these sort of multi-layered family women's story yeah. cultural symbols i mean it, so amazing. it, it was really it was, interesting it had a, a thread yeah, it, it had a thread, yeah. and and, I, and and it felt like the thread that that uh, Sylvia spoke of is that we're all from someplace else, and we're seeing this place from from our roots and bringing a vision to it. So you know, I did I thought that that was really interesting that we were all from the, a different place, and we brought this family community uplift. And Fran, your your work in New York, absolutely. I didn't realize that you were. You were um, well. I knew that you were had shows in New York, but I didn't realize. Yeah, that you... yeah, seven solos. I don't know if I can do any more. But the first show that I had was in '95, and it was uh, hauled there by um, Jim Shipman. Oh, and it's it's broken my heart that he died because oh, he I heard he that. hauled it there and he hung it. He was so wonderful to work with. And he was, uh, Jane, I asked Jane, I said, I'm gonna have a show in New York, how do I get it there? They were huge paintings, huge. You know, I, I worked huge, huge for years. She said, get James Shipman. Wow. And he, was, he was a joy. So he, sad about him. So. I didn't know him. I actually didn't know him. And I read, I've read a lot recently, clearly since his death, but um, 
That's interesting. The community in Pittsburgh. So as out, I mean, we're past the time. I'm sorry to bother you, but I just love to hear what you have to say. But so as outsiders to this artist's community, what helped you acclimate as an artist? Was it AAP or was it like, how, how do you feel about breaking into the art community in Pittsburgh? I'm sorry. I, I want to give credit to AAP because um, for a long, the longest time, I'm not sure how many years, for sure 70 years, Miami. we we were accepted and welcomed into the museum. And the statistics for the attendance surpassed every other exhibition except for the international. And that was factual. Now we've we've had less uh, coverage there, but that to me, exhibiting in an, in an, um, in our museum was a monumental honor. But I also had been exhibiting at the Butler Institute of American Art, and I had to leave Youngstown to realize how uh, what a quality place that is, and how widely recognized it is as a fine depository of no. American art. Still uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Tina, when I first went to a talk by Vanessa German, like what, like I just moved to Pittsburgh. I've been like, that's where I met you. Yeah, that's and Fran came up and she was like, I met, I knew your grandparents. Vanessa was talking about, she's like, I didn't have running water or right. something like that, and she would, and she would come to your house, I think, and like, yeah, she she took up residence with her dogs on my front porch, and <laughs> we fed the dogs, and we made coffee, and we made tea, and we talked. And uh, because her mother was a very dear, dear friend of mine, and she was my daughter's age. So we, I just kind of like oh. worked, you know, worked her around. She, it was a little rough getting started, but, but she was always, she was always wonderful. She always had such a ma major vision. So it was just that she was, she was struggling with, against herself. Yeah, I feel like you passed it on, like you passed on the good karma, like. Yeah, I mean, it's like she was just struggling against herself. And that's where, that's the, the thing that the AAP does when you bring in the, I don't want to say senior, but your, your um, mature artist to, Our so that they can have dialogue with the younger artist. And so we can do that exchange, that reciprocity, because there's a lot of things that we don't know about in terms of social media and you know, promotion and that kind of thing. But we do have living wisdom. Oh my and God. we have uh, a firsthand yes. account of what really happened when. And um, you, you can take a little bit of, it's like making a salad. You can put a little of this and a little of that in there. But, you know, it's all great when it's uh, all mixed together. But uh, yeah, Vanessa was, she was, she just needed a little bit of uh, nurturing. And now, I, you know, wow, what can wow. you say? Yeah, wow. I really enjoyed my board experience. And you know, we artists are very difficult. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very difficult person. <laughs> well, we, we can be I, a little bro I broke through. I broke through with so many artists, and they became my dearest, dearest friends to this day, because we're different. We're a little different, we, we, and we we understand each other finally when we get together. I adore artists. I call my other friends the civilians. <laughs> <laughs> They just don't understand. They just don't understand what we do. Right. Despite, despite mm -hmm. everything, they don't understand. Shayla's on our exhibition committee going and picking up artwork from Tina and photographing it and getting it to me. <laughs> like, well, well, we need help. That's the, the technical part. Um, I think like Don will fight Shayla next time over who gets to go see Tina. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? We, when, I think one of these days we're all going to be able to meet in, and when spring comes, all we have to do is have a circle in the park. It doesn't, that's, all, I'm waiting for spring. That's, I've already started planning for spring. That's right. And, and I, I look forward to when we can actually hug people again. Like that. Oh my! Yes. I, isn't that? Oh gosh! It's just really. Scary. I know. I, I now realize how often I do that because I can't do it. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting thing. See, yeah. and and it's amazing how think um to think how an expression of affection is like like you and me as Latinas. And uh, like we hug and kiss people, like like I'm used to doing that, hugging and kissing people all the time. 
Like, I'm so happy to see you. I'm going to give you a hug. And now that expression of love is like you keep your distance because that's how you express it at this point. That's so true. And it's heartbreaking. And at the same time, it's, you, have to, you have to think of it in a positive way because if you don't, it's, it's not going to help anything. Well, yeah. I, I do think that COVID has some pluses. Like, you know, I've returned to reading poetry. I, I'm used to being alone in my studio. Solitude is, is easy for me. And I have been working, working, working there. There's some good things. Um, cooking at home again for many, many people. Some good things are coming out of it, I hope. The downsizing of all these monumental stores. Do we need monumental stores? I, monumental restaurants? Well, you know, I agree with you. I mean, it's hard. I've been lucky in COVID. I haven't had a tremendous, I haven't been one of the people who suffered greatly at this moment. But I do mm -hmm. something that, um, I thought it was beautiful. It was a writing by an art, a writer named Arundhati Roy. She talked about the, you know, the pandemic as a portal. Like how can you even walk through this portal not carrying our biases with us and our negativity with us and our stereotypes and all the awfulness that we've had that brought us to this? How can we walk through this portal into and create something new? And I, I, I'm butchering the quote and I will send it to you separately. But it's been kind of my thought process of how do we do this, right? How can we do this in this moment? And um, it's a hopefulness, right? Like uh, it, at least, at least that's something. Hope is hope is something for sure. You yeah. guys, we have a bonus reel here now from this. It's continued. It's continued recording, and I'm going to turn the recording off right now. I think. <laughs> 